Thank you very much. Um, first of all, let me say that um, anyone here today uh, does not ask tough question gets to pass with A, right? <laughs> uh, for every tough question you ask, there's a markdown, right? <laughs> if I say so. If I say so, okay. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. It's certainly a pleasure. Um, I consider UWT uh, my college, so it's a, quite a privilege for me to be able to come back here and share with you my experience. Um, you, you, you stole my thunder. I was going to share with you that I'm a proud graduate of UWT. I loved my experience as a student here. I loved the fact we had very small classes back then, probably a little smaller than this one, actually. And we, I thought we had uh, the best and most experienced professors um, back then. I'm sure today is still true. So thank you for, for that. Now, China is such a big country, a big subject. I don't even know where to start. But let me just focus on a couple of things that are near and dear to my own heart. Um, that is the tie that binds China and Washington State. Anybody want to take a guess what that might be? International trade. <laughs> and I also wanted to talk about the connection that keeps trade moving. Anybody want to take a guess? What is that? Oh, that's a nice guess, but no. Uh, it's Washington ports and ports in general. Um, First, just to put things in perspective, um, let me start by showing you a graphic depicting the value of Sino-US trade in the last 12 years. And uh, do you all have a sense of our total trade volume, or not volume, value, let's say in 2013? Anybody have a guess? The total dollar amount that we traded with China, both in and out? This number is going to be shocking to you. $610 billion worth of trade went back and forth between China and US back in 2013. Uh, as you can see from this graphic that imports from China grew at a modest rate until 2010, uh, 2001. That's when China was admitted to the World Trade Organization. Then from that point on, imports from China really took off until 2009, when US went into a recession. And uh, people stopped buying, stopped buying, uh, uh, stopped consuming as much as they did uh, years ago. On the other hand, value of exports from US to China saw small gains year after year up to 2009. As the US plunged into recession and the dollar weakened, um, making U.S. goods more affordable to Chinese consumers. We have seen our exports to China nearly doubled, as you can see from, from this graphic. Now, interesting enough, it is a very different uh, story for trade between Washington State and China, at least for the last five years. The value of imports from China has actually declined since 2008 in part due to the recession and reduced com consumer spending uh, in the U.S. At the same time, we have seen the value of our exports nearly doubled. Despite, uh, despite the drop in exports, China still overtook Canada as Washington State's leading trade partner in 2013, accounting for one-fifth of our trade with the entire world. Um, you can see that uh, Washington exports to China are second only to Canada in terms of value. We export over twice as much as we import. But let me qualify that number a little bit. Um, what do you think is the number one export out of Washington to China? You, you have to know this one. That's a, that's a good guess, but not number one. Not salmon. It's all good, but not number one. What? 
Apples is, is one of those, but not the top one. Uh, Gooey duck. <laughs> duck is definitely gaining popularity in China, and they're expensive, and they're gaining popularity, but not number one. Come on, you don't know. Airplanes. Boeing, the big B, airplanes. And uh, of the $19.5 billion dollar of exports uh, going out of Washington back in 2013, half of that is really, uh, we have to, to thank Boeing for all the jobs and its airplane and parts uh, went to China. Wow, I shouldn't show you that. No, I can't quiz you. <laughs> um, so let me uh, give you, uh, you are actually, your, uh, some of you already answered. Um, you ha must have seen a uh, ship loaded with containers making their way into and out of the port. And you must have seen containers uh, on I-5. Uh, it's, uh, I, I see them all the time, maybe because it's, the fact that I work at the port, so all I see is containers when I drive on I-5. Um, you have made some very good guess in terms of what we send out in the box, exports. Uh, can any of you guess what's coming in, in a container? Come on, you should know this. Nobody want to take a guess? What's coming in in the container? What, what are some of the imports that come into, yes? I would think of electronic goods that are assembled in China, maybe textiles as well. You must be a shopper. You know. <laughs> Made in China. <laughs> That's very good. Very, very good guess. Um, so for, for many, many years, believe it or not, furniture was number one throughout the West Coast ports. That was number one product we brought in from China. But today, to your point, um, it's no longer furniture, and, and we all understand why. Um, replacing furniture, number one, is toys. Toys, uh, games, sports equipment, uh, golf equipment. Uh, number two um, is uh, electronics, and then following that, textile, fashion products, purses, shoes, you name it. And um, export products, and I think some of them some of you mentioned earlier, um, Boeing is definitely number one, and uh, forestry products, um, and a, a lot of ag products like Washington apples, Washington cherries, gooey ducks, um, Washington onions, et cetera, et cetera. You may or may not know that U.S. has been a primary source of, for scrap metal for scrap metal and scrap pep paper and other materials that are recycled and then remanufactured into finished goods that ultimately find their way back to the U.S. I think you mentioned that. Um, with the global recess recession, the U.S. and the rest of the world have been buying less. I have been buying less, which then negatively impact demand for raw material. It's, it's that cycle, right? The, the less we consume, uh, the less raw material we send out to China, uh, scrap metal and, and scrap paper for recycling. And China's economy also slows down a little bit at responding to the U.S. Uh, economy. So as the U.S. economy rebounds, and I hope you're doing your part, buy more, that uh, I'm sure we will see an uptick in the, in the demand for waste paper. So it's all tied, the world is a small place. Um, this give you a sense of, um, I mentioned earlier, forestry products um, and lumber and wood product exports. Um, the export uh, has been astro astronomical over the last few years, uh, last 10, 20 years really, um, given the, the, the economic boom in China that they have experienced. Construction cranes are being called the new Chinese national bird uh, because everywhere you go, there, there, there's, uh, you will see construction sites um, everywhere, in any cities, in any uh, provinces you travel to. 
and I've included a number of companies um, on the bottom that give you a sense of these are all local companies. So if you're in the job market, keep an eye on those, on, on those companies. As income have increased in China, so has the appetite for a wide, wider variety of foods. Our agricultural exports to China reached over $6 billion in 2013. Um, from uh, soybeans, uh, now soybeans are not produced here in Washington, they're from Midwest. And they're shipped uh, to China for producing high grade food grades are made into oh, tofu. Anybody ever tried tofu here? <laughs> it made into soy sauce and uh, lower grades are, are made into uh, animal uh, feed um, for um, raising pigs and cows and other things. Um, and let me ask you this, um, how many of you have had almaroca? Yeah, do you like it? It's pretty tasty, huh? Uh, the nutty chocolate um, and plus the goat colored foil and the pink wrapper, making them hugely popular in China. I, um, two or three years ago, I went to with um, the CEO and their chief marketing officer of Omoroka. They hired um, some of the local um, performers and dressed up like little angels and all wearing pink and um, gold color to and stand all beautiful ladies and girls, and standing in the, the, one of the largest supermarkets in, in Guangzhou and pushing and promoting Amoroka, and uh, hugely popular. So um, it's, it's um, and they're not the only one. Um, so this one, I, I wanted to um, get some help, but before I uh, get there, I'm pretty sure that all of you have heard comments or statements made about importance of exports because exports generate jobs, right? We all have heard that and it's very true. On the flip side, uh, imports are not as good because they took away our jobs here. Um, I'm going to make a statement that may, sh may be a shocking uh, statement to you. Um, I would venture out, venture out to say that without imports, there will be no exports. And here's why. We rely on two-way trade, and imports from China in particular, in particular uh, get the containers we need here in Washington for our export nodes. Ocean carriers depend on revenue from higher paying import containers to make up for the cost of hauling export loads back to China which provide only marginal return. So just to give you a sense, um, this is, um, let's say you pay, one would pay um, $3,000 to, to bring a container uh, from China, from Shanghai. Um, uh, for the exporter, they pay $500. So that's the, that's the, the huge gap between what's coming in, uh, the, the freight cost of a container, uh, container cost. Without imports, ocean carriers could not afford to stay in business. There would be no exports. In my mind, it's that simple. Um, I would like to ask someone to come up and help me uh, with this flow chart. And I, I, have a, I have one target, but I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna point him out just yet. Anybody want to come and help me? I just want you to help me explain the flow because I think you all understand the flow. Any volunteer? If not, I'm going to pick my person. Can you? Of course I can. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you actually touched on that earlier. I'm not a shy person, so. I can tell, but that's great because I'm shy, so it's good. <laughs> make a perfect team, then what can I do? Well, I want you to help me explain what I'm trying to tell the story here. Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, so, okay, so it looks like um, one U.S. family's recycled newspapers go to a U.S. recycling center. It is shipped out and winds up maybe in a factory, it looks like in China. Um, these things are breaking down in materials that can be used for, it looks like, production. 
Um, packaging. Mm -hmm. Packaging, it comes back and it looks like it winds up uh, in your home in what we would call like inferior products or light industrial manufactured goods or toys of some sort. Yeah. I'm not sure I can follow all the arrows, but that's yeah. yeah. It. Well, very good, very good. I think uh, the only part I will, I will point out is, uh, let's say a U.S. family, you're buying a toy for your nephew or niece, and uh, you, you found it in, uh, I don't have a kit, so I don't know where, don't Walmart. Walmart, well, yeah, Walmart, you know, Walmart wherever. <laughs> and most likely, it's done, the design of that toy is done in the U.S., right? It's by a U.S. designer. So the U.S. designer sent the design to China, and the, the Chinese uh, toy manufacturer then manufactures those toys and send it to packaging facility. Meanwhile, your, our waste uh, uh, recycled newspaper gets shipped out all the way to the processing center in China and um, make into the packaging material. And when the toys are ready, guess what? The toys are stuck into the packaging, the package, right? And then your name is? Bob. Bob. And thanks to Bob. You're and and uh, it gets loaded onto a vessel. This happens to be an evergreen vessel. And the vessel gets to Port of Tacoma. It gets offloaded. And sometimes it's probably uh, we're missing a few minor, minor um, linkage here. But it gets offloaded from a vessel. It gets trucked or railed to a DC uh, a distribution center. And from a distribution center, it gets to, uh, to um, uh, retail, like Walmart, uh, uh, Macy, wherever. So that's what I wanted to explain to you. So the wrapping paper, then the, the kids open up wonderful toys and throw out the wrapping pa through the wrapping paper after, I'm sure he will tear up the wrapping paper. And then get, guess what? The wrapping paper gets recycled. So we start this whole loop again, right? When you think about it, it's actually pretty interesting, that, that cycle. Um, and um, this one is almost, it's a bit, it's a reverse, right? So the same container that carried those toys now makes its way to Eastern Washington, where, is, where it is filled with a shipment of wine uh, destined for China. The container ends up on a ship most likely the same uh, evergreen ship um, th that carried in the toys um, a couple days ago. Um, upon arriving in China, uh, it's the, that reversed uh, cycle. Uh, the shipment of Washington wines finds find its way to a DC distribution center, uh, gets offloaded at the port in China, uh, gets uh, uh, drained to a distribution center and then sent to a retail store and then Chinese families buy them and to enjoy them. My point is that the two-way cycle of trade makes more economic sense for ocean carriers, where at one time it was one export container for every two import containers 10 years ago. Today, there are two export containers for every three import containers coming in. Um, I I'm convinced in a few years, we will have a total, totally balanced trade. I think it will come much quicker than we, than we think. So um, this is uh, just another slide to show you the, the, that Washington products are gaining more visibility and popularity as the quality of life has improved with China's economic success. People have more opportunities to be exposed to the products and brands in their day-to-day -day lives with newfound wealth. It is not atypical for a white-collar office worker to start his or her day with a cup of cappuccino from Starbucks and to shop uh, for the latest fashion goods on Amazon and to have Washington salmon or gooey duck for dinner. And of course, throughout the day, there's plenty of time to snack on a Washington apple or a bowl of Washington cherries. And they are not cheap, by the way. 
I, I would uh, eat all my Washington apples here. I would not buy them in China because they're expensive. They're, they're just, uh, I can't afford them when I go to China. Um, by the way, how many of you have been to China? Wow, okay, quite a number. Yeah, okay. Um, here's just another slide uh, showing the growing appetite of Chinese consumers. Um, let me ask you, how many of you have visited a Chinese mall? Oh, okay. How many of you were shocked at the price of a coat or a nice looking shirt in, in those high-end fashion malls? Pretty shocked? Well, me too. I felt really poor when I go back to China because I couldn't afford to buy anything. I just window shop all the time when I <laughs> visit China. You can buy a decent looking uh, shirt here, uh, men's shirt, uh, for $30, $40 uh, at Macy's. I guarantee you pay twice as much, if not three times as much, if you are to buy them in China. So um, they're uh, expensive. As Chinese consumers are not sat and Chinese consumers are no longer satisfied with things they can buy in China, there has been a huge growth in number of visitors to Washington uh, from China for both business and pleasure. In 2013, five percent of the visitors to our state were from China, a 22 percent increase in number. Spending by those visitors also increased by 45%. This trend will continue as the U.S. relaxes its entry visa uh, policy. I'm, I'm convinced we'll see more visitors, more business, more relationships, uh, which will lead to more business opportunities. I wanted to tell you uh, about my, my own sister. She came and visited me last uh, Christmas. She arrived with one suitcase, because when she called me and said, what can I bring you? I said, not a thing, just come. So she came with one suitcase. Um, she left with three mm -hmm. suitcases. And she loved, she loves Costco wholesale. <laughs> I, I thought she made me go shopping with her after my Friday after I get off work at 6.30 and we would shop till when, whenever they close. And I thought of leaving her, just have her overnight there, knock herself out and mm -hmm. shop as much and pack her shopping cart and whatever. And um, I started calling her a uh, Costco-holic. She was not, it was not funny when I took her to SeaTac when, when she had to pay for the overweight uh, luggage because they're expensive. And in case you're curious what she bought, um, she bought uh, jewelry, she bought books, which are heavy, probably had, didn't help with her um, um, overage of luggage. She uh, bought uh, a, a nice watch, um, she bought two or three coats for my brother-in-law, I don't know why, so why would one need this many? So it was not enough, I had to stop her because I didn't want to have to go out and find her a container. But but she was having fun, I tell you. Um, you probably have read, I don't know uh, how many of you subscribe to the uh, Tacoma News Tribune. In the last few weeks, um, there are a number of uh, articles about uh, Chinese investment that will happen in Tacoma. I'm proud to say that uh, your port uh, played a role in a couple of them. Uh, one is uh, this, uh, a two-tower uh, hotel condo complex. Um, it's a mixed-use development. Um, I believe the investment is about 150 to 200 million dollars, and that's really excellent news for Tacoma, for downtown Tacoma, and for Pierce County. And also, um, just today, uh, our port commissioners uh, approved a long-term deal. Um, um, Essentially, uh, uh, we uh, signed a long-term deal with a Chinese company that they're going to build a, a conversion gas conversion plant. Essentially, we'll pipe in natural gas and process it, process it on our port uh, land and, and turn it into methanol, and then ship it uh, in a tank 
to China. Um, and that's $1.8 billion worth of in investment. It's two-phased project. When, when, when it's all completed, it will be a $1.8 million, uh, $1 billion worth of project. So um, let me shift gears, uh, bringing, uh, bring the conversation uh, home to our own backyard, the port of Tacoma, uh, your port. Um, in the bigger scheme of things, the port is a small but yet very critical link for trade with China, with really with anyone, with any country. Seven out of our uh, seven out of our ten weekly international container services call at Chinese ports. Um, virtually all of our uh, international carriers offer services to China from Port of Tacoma. As you can see, I uh, um, highlighted uh, the major ports of call. And I'm sure you might have been to, I'm sure you've been to Shanghai, right? And Qingdao, northern part of China. Um, and trade with China accounts for over 40% of our international container volume and, and value as well uh, uh, in relation to the rest of the world. Of course, containers uh, get most, of atten most attention when people talk about ports and talk about trade with China. But certainly that is not the only thing we do here um, at the Port of Tacoma. Uh, we have a number of other robust businesses uh, here uh, at uh, Port of Tacoma. They all have strong ties with China, strong trade with China. Um, when break bulk is one, um, what, what's considered break bulk? Anything that doesn't fit into a container, we call it break bulk. So it could be a, a uh, agriculture or mining equipment. Uh, it, could in, uh, it could be a piece of machinery that cannot be stuffed into a container. It's brick bulk. Um, we have a lot of um, our brick bulk um, shipment go, go to China. And the other one is log that you saw uh, earlier slide uh, showing um, how they're used, right, for, for building buildings and, and other public infrastructure. Um, and the, the probably lesser known, well, I don't see it here, is we also have a, oh, right here. We also have a grain terminal that we ship out a lot of grains. Uh, and China is top uh, on the list in terms of destination for receiving grains. Now, just for a, just a little bit of fun fact, um, you know why you see so many Kias here? A uh, nice car. Uh, this is not, has nothing to do with China. Because Port of Tacoma is one of the largest gateway receiving Kia from South Korea. So we annually, we, we uh, bring in, mm, I would say, 80 to 100,000 units of Kia vehicles. Different models, but Kia vehicles. And Tacoma has one of the largest Kia um, uh, car, uh, help me out, distributing, yes, on oh, South Tacoma Way, yeah. That's why, because they're coming through uh, your own port. Um, I don't know, this is just an area of the port of Tacoma. I don't know if any of you have ever uh, participated in the, in the port's uh, free boat tour um, during the maritime festival here in the summertime. Sounds like some of you might have. But basically, um, we have uh, two waterways, we call them. And this is Sitcom. And there, this is our office building. The little tiny white dot is our office building. And this is what we call the Blair Waterway. And that, um, uh, that a lot of our container ports are located at. Let me just quickly point out, it's a little hard to see. Um, so here is, um, I mentioned this is our sitcom waterway. On this side of the waterway is what we call the APMT uh, terminal. It's a container terminal. On the other side, uh, we have two terminals. One is, uh, uh, is called um, OCT, 
uh, Olympic um, terminal, container terminal, and that is wholly owned by uh, Yangming Shipping Line, um, which is um, based in Taiwan. And then on the side, we have what we call our brick bulk terminal that handles brick bulks uh, that coming in and going out. Uh, on this waterway, we have a couple of our largest container terminals. One is called um, uh, Husky Terminal. It's a Japanese-owned uh, subsidiary um, uh, K-Line, is the shipping line. And then next to it is uh, what we call um, Washington United. It's owned by Hyundai Group, um, um, a Korean-based uh, carrier, ocean carrier. And then on this, uh, on this basin, on this side, is what we call the Evergreen Terminal, um, or PCT. It's owned by Evergreen. Evergreen has not only a very, the, the world's number four or number three largest co uh, container um, carrier business, they also own the airline. I don't know if you ever uh, took that one. It's called EVA, EVA, EVA. Uh, airline. Uh, they have direct call, direct service into SeaTac. So I want to leave you with um, what do you think is our advantage here uh, at the port of Tacoma? Um, one is obvious. Uh, we are one of the closest U.S. ports to China and to Asia, um, to Asian countries. And we also offer natural deep water so many other ports in the U.S. have to dredge their waterway, and we're lucky we don't have to, and it's naturally deep, deep water. Um, and we all, obviously, one of the marketing messages we, we like to repeat is our easy access in terms of uh, getting on I-5 and other major state highways. And, and the fact that we're located in an industrial zone is giving us a, a leg up. Um, for instance, uh, I'll give you an example of Port of Seattle. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a similar size port, but there are recent, in recent years, they're struggling a little bit because um, if you have been to Pier, I'm sure you have visited Pier 69, and they're right in the middle of the city. Um, and there's always community pressure wanting to repurpose the terminal for other use, like sports uh, arena or, or some other use, a hotel, a nice condo. Um, so, and we're lucky because we're in the protected industrial zone. And lastly, and we have you here, um, we are lucky because we're blessed with a very supportive community here. Our commission is very pro-business and uh, if it makes business sense and it's good for the environment, it creates job, they uh, typically they give us green, green light to go forward. So we're lucky in that way. Um, um, so we know what we have, we're blessed, and, um, and where we're headed uh, so we can stay competitive. Uh, in 2012, we published our 10-year plan, strategic plan, identifying detailed objectives and targets. And you can see it here. So just to put things in, in, in context. So today, last year, we handled um, about 1.9 million TEUs. Uh, TEU is just a, a measurement of containers, how many containers coming in. And our goal is to reach 3 million TEUs. And I think this year we will do, I think we'll, 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 we'll break 2 million TEUs, and probably around 2.1 million TEUs. So um, I think we're on our way to achieve that 3 million. So um, I don't know if you have any questions about the next couple of slides. This is really about what, um, what we have uh, as our target for the next 10 years. Um, China will continue to be a, a, a big part of our trade. Uh, just last week, I met with a major retailer, 
when I asked him about his sourcing strategy, because I'm sure you have all read uh, from many, many uh, news coverage that um, uh, uh, production costs in China have been going up. And, um, and there, there has been a lot of articles talking about near sourcing, about shifting production bases to Vietnam or to India or to other uh, Southeast Asian countries. Um, so that, that's part of the reason why I asked that question. Um, and his answer uh, was no. And the primary reason is that the scale of production and experience of the workers simply cannot be found anywhere else in the world. So that's very reassuring to me. Um, they have been, most of their uh, products, 80% of their products um, coming from China. And I might just as well tell you the retail, retailer's name is Target. 80% of their products coming from China. And about 5% coming out of uh, Vietnam. And India, that really surprised me, is a fraction of that, 2% you know, or something. And when I asked why, um, lack of infrastructure and lack of skilled um, workforce. And, um, uh, within that country, too many frictions. It's hard to get anything done. Well, uh, don't 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 quote me on that. But, uh, mm -hmm. but <laughs> um, with this, I would like to conclude my um, presentation. And I wanted to. Uh, I don't know if I'm over my time or not. Oh, good. I don't know if you have any questions. I wanted to remind you if it's. Uh, I I can refuse answer any questions. I don't have an answer for so. <laughs> Say that again. How long? Um, two days. Sometimes faster, depending on the service, right? Um, some of the service are express service, so maybe a lot faster. And also depends on depends on the size of the vessel, right? If it's a 10,000 TU vessel uh, with 10,000 containers, you have to offload. That's going to take some time to offload that. Um, uh, so it depends. But typically, a couple of days, or one, sometimes one 24-hour turnaround. Uh, typically, it's a couple of days. Yeah. Somebody, yeah. Um, how, does, how much electronic waste or toxic waste does the Port of Tacoma export to China? Oh, this is a loaded question. Why you ask? <laughs> um, are you talking you about, numbers on that? I, I, you know, I don't have that n specific number. Are you talking about like scrap metal and scrap uh, specifically paper? Specifically used like computers, televisions, uh, keyboards, iPods, cell phones, et cetera, batteries. Uh, you know, my guess is um, not as much as you think, you might think. I think because frankly, um, if you uh, you visited China, right? I remember yeah. you raised your hand. My sister's cell phone is far more advanced than mine, so I don't think th that might have been the case 20 years ago or, or 25 years ago. I don't think it's it's the case anymore. Um, I think they're shipped, if anything, to countries like Vietnam or India, uh, that that relatively speaking less developed countries now. And you know, I'm just shocked. All the gadgets, every time I go back, I couldn't figure them out, so I stick with my BlackBerry. <laughs> um, they're just so far advanced. Or I guess yeah. um, not targeted towards reuse, but targeted towards recycling uh, the scrap metal from the uh, That, 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 um, I, 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 don't, I don't have an answer, yeah. But I know there's, um, uh, the U uh, no, U.S. Chinese customs also have pretty strict uh, rules about what's, what can come in. You have to declare what's the content of your shipment. So they're, they're, uh, uh, they're pretty tough, especially the last few years. Yeah, I can't answer specifically not exactly how much. Yeah. Yeah. One of your bullet point goals was to reduce diesel emissions by 85% of them. 
Um, so, for instance, um, we have uh, in recent years um, uh, we, we accomplished that not just by ourselves but working with our carriers, right? So, uh, I'll give you a, a, a couple of examples. Uh, in recent years, I would say it's a couple of years ago, we, we start purchasing electric vehicles for handling a yard, you know, container yard for moving containers and this and that. And another uh, development. Um, that I, I think we can expect to see um, that's coming our way is um, th these large container vessels um, will be w are, are looking into uh, using LNG, liquefied natural gas, to power that. So that's as clean as you get. So we're all moving in that direction. And um, Washington State uh, has a pretty uh, Robust uh, environmental uh, EPA, um, yeah. But they're they're. Uh, I, I stay away from them. <laughs> I know that there has been some talk about the um, U.S. courts um, building the capacity for us to export natural gas since we have just an abundance of it here right now. And yeah. We're finding more and more every day. Yeah. Has the Port of Tacoma looked into that as an option at all? Funny thing you ask. Um, it's it's trade secret, so I can't tell you. <laughs> but um, but that's the future. That is the future. Um, and to your point, we we do have abundance of natural gas. Um, but uh, in order to handle export of natural gas, uh, it, uh, it it it, uh, it takes a huge um, uh, facility. It, it needs the the requirement of a terminal in order to handle export of natural gas. It is quite um, uh, the investment is quite massive. Um, uh, I, I'm simply looking at what ports might have a possibility to do it, and maybe I can rephrase that. Seeing that there are, it is the port that could do it is somewhat limited in their ability just because of their land and how they're whatever. Is it a possibility for the port of Tacoma? It is. It is. It is a possibility. It is, and, and to your point, because we have room. For growth. Right. Yeah. And the other thing I was going to ask is, um, as far as ports in the United States of America go, mm -hmm. where is the Port of Tacoma ranking right now? I mean, I know we have major uh, ports, of course, mm -hmm. you know, San mm -hmm. Diego, mm -hmm. we have, mm -hmm. the, you know, Port of Los Angeles, mm -hmm. Seattle, and then we have, you know, Jacksonville and mm -hmm. Houston. Where, where do we fit in that? We're place? harboring around number eight or number nine. Not bad, but that's not my target. I yeah. want to be number, well, I wouldn't call number one. <laughs> um, so here's, to put things in perspective, um, um, LA and Long Beach combined is the largest container load center in North America, no, no question. And it's simple, the reason is simple, because of the population, right? We, our population is what? Uh, 6.87 million, approximately, in Washington. So for whole state, so we don't, we just simply cannot compete. So, um, so LA and Long Beach is considered number one when they look combined, and then um, uh, New York and New Jersey is considered number two when they combine, and Seattle and Tacoma, when we add our numbers together, we're considered number three load center, a container load center in North America. But thank you for that question. Um, um, that, that depends. We, um, the port uh, of Tacoma, um, so there, there are different buckets, right? Um, I'm considered a management side, and, and so our administrative and management side, and that's quite small. Um, I, I don't know if any one of you want to guess, because that surprised me when I first joined the port. I thought, hmm, port of Tacoma, it's got to be 800 people, right? 800 people strong. Um, 135 or 135 to 140. I'm just talking about port staff. Now, um, we also have a large um, uh, workforce longshoremen, but that's union job that you, you apply through the union, um, their protocol. So port is not involved. Uh, that's longshore. Now, Port of Tacoma, we do uh, have uh, another workforce, what we call 
uh, IOW Local 22, and, and that workforce uh, is responsible for uh, maintenance of equipment and sites, terminal repair, and this and that. And that does uh, uh, go through the port. So we post our jobs online looking for uh, those type of uh, workers. Yeah, I, I probably didn't answer. So, the so the 4,700 increase, is that, is that In consideration everything? Everything, yeah. No more? Hi. I was wondering uh, how much does it cost per container um, of recycling to ship over to China? To where? To China? Um, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think I mentioned earlier, I, in today's market, uh, five or $600. Mm -hmm. Shockingly cheap, isn't it? But to bring a container in, you build uh, probably three or four thousand dollars. Yeah. When you say shipping out, you mean like six hundred dollars to get into the Chinese port? To so what I mean? Travel. Yeah. What I mean is that six hundred dollars would be would include the ocean freight. So from let's say from uh, port of Tacoma, it gets loaded right into a container. That container travels all the way to port of Shanghai. So that's six hundred dollars. But if there's like Um, so there are different sizes of container sh vessels. Um, and our average size uh, vessels that today, calling Port of Tacoma, I, I would say it's about 6,500 TU vessels. The largest one we had at the port um, is 10,000. What was 10,000 TU vessel? And, but that's the trend, that's the future, because things are getting bigger. Um, and. Um, so they can achieve that that um, uh, a greater uh, smaller um, cost of per unit, right? Um, uh, cost efficiency. I don't know if that answered your question. But yeah. It depends. If it's express service, it could be seven days. Um, remember, they stop in multiple ports, so it's not just a street. Unless it's express service, that's sometimes a lot faster. But uh, I don't have a copy of it, but if you go to our website and there is what we call rotation schedule, it's, um, it's like taking an airplane, right? Yeah, you, you, um, you fly to China, uh, you might have to stop in Japan or you might have to make a stop in Korea or, or somewhere to make that connecting flight. So, same is true with the uh, container vessel. So they stop at different ports and pick up. So when the when a vessel leaving port of Tacoma it might not be fully loaded because they might stop and travel to uh, Vancouver, BC to pick up 20,000 <coughs> containers from that market. And then it travels to another port and pick up an additional 5,000 containers and so on and so forth. So it's not a street um, A to Z. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's dinner time. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, Can I ask one question? Hmm, okay. <laughs> so, uh, well, you talked a little bit before about the growing demand for U.S. produced products, mm -hmm. and I think that's uh, one thing that people get really interested in. Mm -hmm. And my, you know, I, I'd be really interested to hear uh, how have those companies kind of broken into the domestic Chinese market? What kind of challenges? Market entry. Marketing and, mm -hmm. and just making consumers aware of their brand. Um, I, you, I, I think. A big question. It, it is no, no, no problem. Uh, I, I mentioned Almoroka, right? Um, uh, let me give you another example. Let's see Washington wine, right? Washington wine were not as well known before, and uh, in the last ten years. Uh, our governor of Washington State um, started from Gary to uh, Jay Inslee, all have been pushing for Washington wines and say, we're, known, we're not known for our quantity, but we're known for our quality. Now, um, 
but Chinese consumer didn't know that much about Washington wine. So uh, what we, uh, I, I, I was somewhat involved with uh, market entry strategy. When we looked at the market, and, um, we, we thought the best way to get into the Chinese market is to identify those high-end hotels, uh, to ident identify high-end hotels and high-end private clubs and restaurants and using that as our entry strategy to enter uh, into the marketplace. Um, so that's what we did, and this, not we, but this uh, customer, uh, this client, um, and uh, did many, many uh, wine, hosted many, many wine testing, testing uh, events, um, co-sponsoring those events with a, a well-known hotel uh, or a well-known private club and restaurants, and so, it started, uh, actually it's a real example, um, because this is tied married to the Fuzhou, uh, Fuzhou trade project that I helped started uh, four years ago. It's a trade project started, uh, founded by the city of Tacoma and the port of Tacoma. So one of our commissioners had this vision and said, how can we build on the sister cities program and so it's not just merely cultural and I educational exchange, but really how can we uh, take that up to another level and um, have some tangible economic and business exchange. So we, I worked with a small group of people and put together this pilot project. And, and um, actually this um, earlier slide, this hotel project is, is the result of that. So, it's just a couple examples. It's it's quite fun. It's uh, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I bought a three hundred Chinese won the other day. Was that a good idea? What? Say that again. I bought three hundred Chinese won the other day. Was that a good idea? Oh, Chinese. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I didn't quite understand your Chinese. Sorry. <laughs> uh, is that a good idea? Uh, I think you should. Well, I'll tell you, uh, you, you can tell me if it's a good idea or not. So um, being a, a, a good daughter that I am, <laughs> I've been sending my mom and dad, um, you know, money over the years, every time I visit them or, or every time when they uh, come and visit me, I, you know, give them what we call pocket money or, or red envelopes to, so they can use as their spending money. Uh, they're ob obviously, I give them in U.S. dollars. So up to um, five years ago, um, they kept it in their bank in U.S. dollars. And five years ago, he, she called me and said, you know what, honey, uh, I'm going to convert all that into Chinese yuan. I, um, for obvious reasons, because U.S. dollars um, has, um, has not been doing as, as well over the last five or ten years as, as it had, you know. Uh, it used to be, uh, I remember 20 years ago, um, uh, when I w went back to uh, visit uh, China, um, I didn't feel as poor as I felt today. <laughs> and at the time, the exchange rate was, um, I think, uh, one to eight. So for uh, one US dollars, you get eight yuan. Um, but today is one to six, right? Approximately one to six. I won't be surprised in a year it will be one to five, or one to four. Yeah. So. Well, I think we are out of time with that. So uh, let's all give uh, Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much.